Here we are continuing with part two of our lecture for week four, where we continue to look at this issue of the global coronavirus pandemic and religion. So in this uh, next hour, we're looking at Save the Economy, Liberty, and Yourself, Christian Nationalism and Americans' Views on Government 19 Restrictions by Samuel Perry, Andrew Whitehead, and Joshua Grubbs. And you see a good example of that kind of resistance here uh, from Texas, where people are saying they will not take the mark of the beast, i.e. the 2020 COVID vaccine ID chip. Now, as Perry and co-authors argue, public responses in the U.S. to the COVID-19 pandemic have uh, varied widely, um, with major difference between those on the left and the right. Um, but as they note, vaccine skepticism and vaccine opposition has mostly emerged from the conservative religious right, um, as well as claims that government health restrictions are illegitimate and threaten Christian religious freedoms and even American capitalism. As they argue, we propose that a critical ideological element that undergirds many of the political and religious rationales for anti-restriction discourse is Christian nationalism. But this remain a pervasive ideology constituted by identities, values, and historical narratives that center on preserving or, quote, restoring the preeminence of an identitarian and embattled form of Christianity in American civic life. And as these authors point out, based on their research on Christian nationalism and COVID-19 skepticism, um, these are very closely linked. Both their own research as well as others have come to the same conclusion. But what we know less about, they point out, is how Christian nationalists have been responding to the most recent government COVID-19 restrictions. So as they suggest, both political and Christian conservatism unite and amplify one another um, within Christian nationalism. And we've certainly seen this with protests against COVID-19 restrictions and lockdowns in the past year. Now, as they point out, there's a long and complex history around Christian nationalism and sort of the rise of what um, Haynes in our next article refers to as the Christian right that goes back to kind of post-World War II periods and the Cold War era. We talked about some of this earlier, the idea of the capitalist West versus the communist East um, and the way that uh, global religious dynamics have been driving some of these changes. Um, but as they also know, allegiance to free market capitalism and the kind of related suspicion of government overreach became sort of quote unquote Christian values in this period. Um, and in subsequent decades from the 1980s onwards, um, the Republican Party was able, they argue, to further consolidate these ideological links between uh, Christian identity, patriotism, and neoliberal economics. And this is where we begin to see really the rise of the Christian right as a political force in the United States. Uh, for example, after 1980, with the election of Ronald Reagan, the president of the US, um, the emergence of the moral majority in 1979, and, and fights against LGBTQ rights and reproductive rights, things like pro-life legislation um, and legal protections, and the various support for both market reforms, uh, privatization, the dismantling of the welfare state. So all these trends um, being driven by this kind of uh, religious or Christian right emerging in the 1980s. So by the uh, 2000s, we could start to look at uh, the Tea Party as sort of championing many of these values. Um, although the Tea Party now is essentially a bygone uh, sort of movement, many of you may be even too young to really know anything about the Tea Party. Um, in more recent years, we've seen these kind of Christian nationalist movements and economic libertarianism being embraced um, by QAnon adherents and groups like the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers, um, as well as many vocal Trump supporters. And as our authors argue, um, these beliefs have also led prominent Republican um, political leaders to express skepticism, or in many cases outright hostility, um, to COVID-19 restrictions, either from the federal government or at the state level, um, particularly those that in some way were seen as infringing on either church or the economy. In fact, some Christian fundamentalists went so far as to suggest that COVID-19 was somehow the work of the devil. Uh, for example, one conservative religious a uh, pundit from a, an important Catholic uh, journal argued there's a demonic side to the sentimentalism of saving lives at any cost. The mass shutdown of society to fight the spread of COVID-19 creates a perverse, even demonic atmosphere. And we saw many other religious conservatives denounce uh, COVID-19 social distancing guidelines as a threat to capitalism, uh, to religious freedom, to individual liberties, and in some cases, even to America itself. Uh, so as Perry and his co-authors argue, adherence to Christian nationalist ideology was the leading predictor that Americans engaged in, quote, incautious behavior in May 2020, such as attending gatherings of more than 10 people, 
um, eating out at a restaurant or shopping for non-essential items. And it was the second leading predictor that Americans failed to show recommended precautions, um, such as wearing masks. Now, because of this, our authors hypothesized that Christian nationalism uh, will powerfully predict that American uh, prioritize the economy and individual liberty over protection of immune compromised or otherwise vulnerable um, populations. And to try to kind of test that theory, uh, they basically went and looked at three sets of public opinion data that had been collected between 2019 and 2020 through YouGov as part of the public discourse and ethics survey. And they kind of honed in on three key sets of themes, um, save the economy, save liberty, and save the vulnerable to try to measure these kind of Christian nationalist sentiments. And so as they kind of hypothesize, you can see here in figure one from the article we read about predicted values of kind of American views um, related to social distancing. So you can see there basically uh, one on the bottom being kind of strongly agreeing, uh, sorry, strongly disagreeing to five being strongly agreeing, um, and then the scale of Christian nationalism on the bottom. So as you move further right, sort of stronger on the Christian nationalist scale, we see more and more strong um, agreement for the need to save the economy or save liberty or stronger disagreement about the importance of saving the vulnerable. And so, for example, just as a reminder from the survey, examples of um, strong sort of uh, agreements with saving the economy would be with statements like, we must lift social distancing restrictions as soon as possible in order to avoid economic collapse. And under the category of save liberty, uh, strong agreement that citizens have the right to expose themselves to risk if they would prefer to work and travel freely. So as our authors found when they were testing their hypothesis, um, these trends are consistent with the direction of association we see among males, Republicans, political conservatives, born-again Protestants, and those who are more religious. In other words, as they note, all those characteristics associated with Christian nationalism. And they argued that we see that Christian nationalism powerfully predicts Americans' views towards mandated distancing restrictions um, in the ways that they had predicted in their paper. Now, the authors also found one really fascinating bit that perhaps is not intuitive and you wouldn't have guessed, um, and that was that religious views themselves are actually not a very good predictor for political views. So, for example, as they noted, at the bivariate level, so when you're just looking at two variables, uh, religi religiosity was associated with Americans prioritizing the economy and liberty and deprioritizing the vulnerable. Uh, but once Christian nationalism was accounted for in a multivariate model, so you're looking at multiple different variables on how each of them play kind of together in shaping opinions, religiosity is actually associated with favoring imposed restrictions in spite of concerns about the economy and liberty. And it's also positively associated with concerns for protecting the vulnerable. So this is really interesting. So what this suggests is that the most important variable in this mix is actually politics. And then after that, politics plus religion. So when you have strong Christian religious beliefs by themselves, that doesn't tell us anything. But when those are combined with conservative nationalist leanings and sort of conservative politics, then we see these damaging kind of Christian nationalist ideologies emerge that prioritize you know, these individualist uh, concerns over the, the general welfare. So religion on its own actually pushes people in the opposite direction, towards more care for the vulnerable and greater support for government COVID-19 restrictions. So this is a great example why we want to kind of um, think about and pay attention to these nuances going on. So here's a little clip from um, Dr. Sam Perry, who's one of the authors of this article. I'm talking a little bit more about some of this research around COVID-19 and Christian nationalism. Take a listen. Uh, in the book, we define it as an ideology that idealizes and advocates a fusion of American civic life with a certain kind of Christianity. And so whenever I say Christianity there, I, I always want to put an asterisk by it, uh, mm -hmm. because the word Christian to people who are scoring high on our measure of Christian nationalism, and I'll talk about that in a second, but uh, when I say the word Christian, it doesn't just mean somebody who has a has a, a a belief in Jesus or says that that they're a disciple of Jesus or or wants to follow Jesus or or all of those things uh, what it means is somebody who who when they say Christian they mean people like me and for uh, white Americans primarily uh, it means people who are white uh, it often means people who are it implies that you're born in this country uh, so native born that you're a citizen and that you're a cultural conservative and if you're a a Christian like they are, like a, a, a conservative Protestant, fine, but mostly Christian is just kind of an identity marker in that sense. And so 
what this group wants to do is they they people who score higher on this this kind of value of Christian nationalism want to uh, advocate a fusion of a certain kind of Christianity, that kind of Christianity with American civic life and belonging. They want to institutionalize that uh, to see it um, uh, set in the laws and in the policies that we operate this country by. So, I mean, it, it sounds to me, and this is how I've, I've pictured it for a while, this is a fight about what it means to be an American, a fight for the American identity. So that, you know, in their mind, to be American is to be Christian, asterisk, right. <laughs> and to be Christian is to be American. But, you know, I want to touch on something that you, you just got to there. Being a Christian, your research shows that being Christian nationalist is not the same as being Christian. And I, I think that's really critical for people to understand, and it, it, we'll talk about the way it shows up and it has these interesting dichotomies. But can you can you talk about that a little bit, how these are not exactly the same thing? Tease that out for our listeners a little more. Right, for sure. And, and what we try to do in the book is from, from basically the preface is we, we try to clarify that when we're talking about Christian nationalism, we're, we're not picking a fight with all believers of all religions and certain not even all Christians. Uh, it really is not about religion per se. It's, it's about this kind of political theology that masquerades as religion. It uses Christian language to disguise uh, political designs, right? Like it's, it's, uh, it is foundationally political. Uh, it's, it's, it's basically ethnic uh, to the extent that it's held by white Americans. I mean, it very much kind of takes on this really ethnic flavor when I mean uh, Christian means people like us. Uh, and so it's it's not Christianity, and in fact, it, it behaves a lot differently uh, from from religious practice. We have a little graph that we can we can talk about in a little bit. But but what we often find, and this this actually shows up in study after study, is when we account for Christian nationalists, this Christian nationalist ideology, oftentimes being more religious behaves in the exact opposite direction. So Christian nationalism it seems to incline people to become more xenophobic more racist, more fearful of religious outsiders, um, more, uh, more resistant to common sense gun control, uh, more, uh, more, in favor of, more in favor of violating recommendations, we'll talk about this in a second, more in favor <laughs> of violating health recommendations when it comes to coronavirus. But we actually find that once we account for Christian nationalism, being more religious uh, oftentimes is is uh, it points to being more pro-social and agreeable in a lot of uh, I think meaningful ways. So as uh, we heard there from Perry and talking about his book, which uh, this paper um, was an earlier version of Christian nationalist ideology, even after accounting for these socio-demographic, religious, and political characteristics, um, is the leading predictor that Americans prioritize the economy and deprioritize the vulnerable. And it's the second leading predictor behind only political conservatism of prioritizing individual liberty. So again, this is really important to stress when we're thinking about um, <clears throat> religion and global politics is even within one uh, specific religious tradition, Christianity, uh, there's a, a huge range of diversity here. And it's only within this kind of very small subset, we're talking about probably less than, let's say 15 or 20% of the entire United States, and that even might be a bit of an exaggeration, um, who might fit in this kind of Christian nationalist ideology. And as Perry was just mentioning there, um, there are really important and actually uh, oppositional tendencies um, between some of these Christian nationalist arguments and kind of Christianity as a faith tradition um, in itself. So as they note, and this is kind of an important point for us to think about as sort of scholars of religion, um, clearly social scientists, pollsters, and those in the media need to employ greater nuance when explaining why so many Americans are resistant to governments implementing and or maintaining sweeping social distancing restrictions. The answer is not political partisanship or evangelicalism per se, um, but much of it has to do with this pervasive ideology that blends Christian identity with conceptions of economic prosperity and individual liberty, um, even at the expense of the vulnerable. And you can see here just from kind of two random pictures that I um, pulled out from U.S. protests against coronavirus, uh, the top one from California and the bottom one from, I believe it was uh, Colorado, um, where you see the idea that social distancing is uh, communism and that uh, freedom should trump safety um, and communism. So again, this idea that uh, somehow um, social distancing guidelines, COVID guidelines are not only anti-American, but they're actually communistic. And we've heard this a lot from conservative um, kind of pundits 
who have been attacking these, that it's a kind of slow slide towards communism or socialism. Again, because it conflicts with their understanding of what America is um, and the centrality of these kind of religious freedoms and religious virtues. Now, in the article we read from Jeffrey Haynes, Donald Trump, the Christian right in COVID-19, the politics of religious freedom, we delve a little bit more deeply into these questions, particularly the church-state kind of relationship here. And you can see some of these protests um, from different parts of the country arguing for churches to be opened up. Now, what Haynes argues in his paper, um, and really it builds on findings of Perry and others, is that the links between religious freedom and secular governments are actually quite important and that much of the strong support for um, Trump among religious conservatives was based on a sort of a very intentional political calculation um, that his election would help advance their religious political agendas um, particularly rolling back issues for LGBTQ rights, um, women's reproductive rights issues um, through both legislative changes and judicial activism. And this is exactly what we see now with the Supreme Court stacked with conservative Christians um, who now are on the verge of possibly rolling back some of these legal protections and have already in some cases. Now, in other ways, Hayes argues, uh, and importantly, Trump was not successful in advancing all of the kind of Christian political rights agenda, um, particularly those relating to COVID-19 restrictions, um, which was a key issue. So despite the lack of leadership from um, Trump, several uh, sort of Christian fundamentalist groups decided to just kind of take matters into their own hands. Liberty Council being kind of one of the leading examples of this. And this is actually part of a much bigger trend where we've seen um, lots of small kind of state or regional based conservative religious organizations um, challenging a whole range of different political issues through uh, lawsuits. But what really unites the, these various members of the Christian right is the shared belief um, Haynes argues that America's Christian foundations are fatally undermined by secularization and it's crucial to reverse this trend in order to return to what they understand to be the founding Christian values of America. And critically, these lawsuits are one way to do that. Now, as we've seen, we can kind of trace the origins of the Christian right back all the way at least in the 1980s, and some people would argue earlier. Um, but importantly, recent demographic shifts in the last 10 or 20 years, um, ha particularly um, since 2000, let's say, are really driving these kind of increasing levels of religious political activism and some of this religious militancy we've been looking at in the United States um, because historically dominant groups are losing power, which in the United States means middle class white male Protestant Christians from Western European ethnic descent, um, who, the kind of who look like us people that um, uh, Perry was talking about in that video interview. And we saw this really clearly in display, if you remember, um, when white nationalists were marching around Charlottesville with torches shouting, you will not replace us. Um, it's this kind of idea that, um, you know, particularly white male uh, Christians are losing power and something has to be done to address this. So as Haynes notes, uh, white Christian conservatives, once the quote, silent majority, are no longer a demographic majority in America today. And many feel beleaguered. Many regarded Trump as their savior, and Trump's aim to, quote, make America great again, involved policies with which most white Christian conservatives strongly agreed. Um, the percentage reduction in white Christians was accompanied, um, as he notes, by a growing sense among many that America's, quote, unquote, Christian values had significantly declined. And again, this speaks to the argument we heard from Jurgens Meyer in weeks one and two about these broader global religious trends that are driving religious violence and calling into question uh, the kind of the authority of the secular state and this kind of political liberalism that underlies it. Uh, movements which are noted, uh, which are rooted, he noted, in these identity-based grievances and losses of power, either real or perceived. Um, and if we kind of step back from the U.S. context and think about these on a broader global scale, we can see that kind of white Christians of European descent uh, are becoming a global minority in many places, and that dynamic is driving the surge of Christian nationalism. The United States, the UK, and Denmark with Anders Breivik, in France, in Germany, um, in any country where we've seen a backlash against immigrants, against Muslims, um, against foreigners and outsiders, um, it's very uh, strongly connected to these growing and shifting religious demographics. Um, so we heard a lot about the American Atlas um, in the article we read. I wanted to take a look at kind of more recent data from um, 2020 to kind of give us a sense of how these are changing. So I just pulled out randomly California where we're at with Chico. 
Tennessee, Ohio, and New York as four examples. So two kind of liberal elite coastal areas and two more kind of Midwest or Southern states to kind of see how these um, demographics are changing. And what you can see, I put red boxes around a couple here. So you've got um, the different kind of religious traditions on the right there in terms of response rates. And then you've got the number in California and New York, Ohio, and Tennessee. So what you see is that, uh, for example, white evangelical Protestants are making up an increasingly small amount, 9% in California, 6% in New York, but still significant, 17% in Ohio and 27% in Tennessee. Uh, and similarly, white mainline Protestants, a little bit more still, 12% in both California and New York, um, but significantly more, 20% and 19% in Ohio and Tennessee. Now, importantly, we see uh, one difference here when we look at Catholics, white Catholics and Hispanic Catholics. We can see 19% of California identify as Hispanic Catholics, 12% uh, in New York, but only 2% in Ohio and Tennessee. Similarly with uh, white Catholics, small, 9% in California, much larger um, in Ohio and New York, 17 to 14%, but not as many in Tennessee, only 7% there. Um, but interesting, if we look at Judaism, we see um, only 1% in California, 4% in New York, which is not surprising. There's a huge Jewish community in New York, um, and 1% in Ohio and Tennessee. So you can see some of these different demographic trends between the coast um, and the Midwest, where we see um, the kind of the most dramatic shifts taking place. But in much of the other religious traditions, black Protestants, um, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Buddhists, Hindus, uh, Muslims, and others, there's not really a significant difference between different parts of the country. Now, as Haynes argued about these kind of shifting cultural and social changes in the 1960s, as well as um, the demographic shifts we've been talking about, the world that white Christian conservatives thought they knew appeared to be disappearing. They didn't like what they saw, and they wanted it reversed. And these two developments, the numerical decline of white Christians and the growing liberalism of American on many social issues, um, essentially makes it implausible that a re-Christianization of America is going to occur on any large scale, um, and particularly the voluntary re-adoption of these kind of Christian conservative values. So if you're a Christian nationalist and you want these things to happen, what do you do? Well, Haynes argues the answer is to revive and embed Christian conservative values in legislation um, and through kind of the gateway of religious freedom. And this is where we really saw the birth of the kind of political uh, Christian right in the United States. So again, as I mentioned, you have the Mormon majority being formed in 1979 um, and key influential activists like Jerry Falwell and Pat Buchanan, as well as kind of a broader shifting political context with evangelicals like Jimmy Carter being elected a president in the late 70s, and then Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher coming in in the 80s. So this kind of embrace of religious politics we saw again kind of revived after the Clinton period and the Bush years. Um, and certainly re uh, with a renewed force when Trump came into office in 2016. Now, as Haynes argues about the kind of Christian rights embrace of Trump, um, in the context of seemingly inexorable secularization, it would not be enough simply to assert that Americans should become, quote, better Christians. It would be necessary to legislate to enforce a return to particularistic religious values favored by the Christian right. And one of the key strategies that these groups saw to do that was by gaining control of the Supreme Court. Now, uh, Haynes talks about a historian and evangelical writer, John Fay, who has identified three overlapping strands within these kind of Christian right dynamics today, which he refers to as court evangelicals. Um, and these are basically Christian political advocates, either insider politicians or kind of the broader public, who not only supported Trump, but helped kind of promote um, and bring these kind of politics center, uh, kind of into center stage um, for his campaign and his four years in office. And so the first of these is a section of the mainstream Christian right, which goes back to the 1980s, the one we've been talking about. Um, a second group of these court evangelicals, uh, Faye argues, is th these independent charismatics who claim the gift of Pentecostal tradition. So, you know, visions, miracles, speaking in tongues, direct revelations from God, uh, but don't necessarily belong to kind of an established Pentecostal group. Um, and importantly, this is one of the largest, uh, the groups that's been growing um, in many parts of Africa. So when we looked at the impact, for example, of Pentecostal um, Christianity on traditional African beliefs in Maui and Zambia last week, this would be a good example of um, the kind of broader glowing, growing intersection of these religious practices and traditions.
Um, and the third group of these court evangelicals that Fea talks about are those advocates of the kind of prosperity gospel or the gospel of wealth, um, which advocates that um, similar to kind of the Pentecostal charismatics, but uh, more emphasis on material rewards. So the idea is that if you follow the kind of the prosperity gospel, um, you will be rewarded by uh, Christianity by yourself uh, becoming kind of wealthy. So this appeals um, in particular to kind of more working class Christians um, who can be somehow convinced that if they only pray hard enough and give enough money to the church, that somehow God will favor them with financial rewards. Sadly, uh, that doesn't tend to be the case, but it's an important um, political ideology within these uh, more conservative Christian circles. And we also see, as Haynes talks about, individuals, for example, Mike Pence is the vice president, um, Pompeo, William Barr, and others who helped to not only bring in these conservative religious values and politics into um, the kind of Trump administration, um, but were also part of this larger and broader landscape of cultural and political influences that uh, helped fight against taking a more active uh, stance and earlier response to COVID outbreaks, and also continued to put pressure against things like mandatory social distancing guidelines, masking regulations, um, and various closures, either temporary um, or more long-term on uh, churches and places of worship. So as Perry and his co-authors argue, this mix of conservative politics, religious nationalism, and unfettered capitalism is really that primary force that's driving public opposition to both COVID-19 vaccines and these other health restrictions. So if we dig in a little bit deeper into um, some of this data, um, we can get a better sense of how this is playing out. So this is from uh, March 2021 survey by PRRI and IFYC. So again, this is one of the public religion research institutes that we've looked at data from earlier. And what they found when they were looking at the relationship between vaccine acceptance, hesitancy, and refusal by religious affiliations um, are a few interesting things. So first, uh, the, what jumps out is that 85% of um, Jews that were surveyed were acceptors of um, getting vaccines, only 10% hesitant, and barely 5% refusers. So very significant um, religious uh, driving motivation there. And then the very opposite where less than 45% of white evangelical Protestants um, were accepting of the vaccine, 28% were hesitant, and the largest group of any religious community, 26%, um, were outright refusers. Um, followed shortly after by 20% um, other Protestants of color who were also um, significant refusers, and then um, black Protestants, Mormons, and Hispanic Protestants. If we kind of uh, tease this out by different kinds of religious practices, what we see is that um, those most likely to accept vaccines um, within sort of the broader Christian community tend to be white Catholics, um, strongest amongst those who attend services, and only slightly stronger amongst those who seldom or never attend. So this is really an interesting dynamic. So. As a white Catholic, it doesn't seem to matter whether you go to church regularly or only maybe on a few high holy days. Um, the difference is only very little, about five percentage points, um, about your being willing to accept or even being hesitant um, about taking vaccines. Uh, and the flip side of that is if we look at white evangelical Protestants. We don't see, again, much difference between attending uh, services regularly or seldomly. Um, led to only a few percentage points difference of those who accepted, 43 versus 78 percent. Um, but we see there a significant um, impact on those who refuse. So 26 percent of those who attend services regularly um, refuse to uh, take the vaccine um, versus 27 percent who seldom or never attend church, again, also refusing to accept the vaccine. So this kind of gets to one of the points Perry was talking about earlier, which is that um, someone's kind of religious faith or attendance in church or frequency of religious uh, kind of devotion doesn't actually tell us a lot on its own about whether or not people are likely to accept or refuse um, COVID vaccine and other beliefs. But when we tie this with other political beliefs, the nationalist beliefs, the conservative political beliefs, um, then we start to really see these come out. But again, if we're looking at you know white Catholics, white mainland Protestants, Hispanic Catholics, black Protestants, or white evangelical Protestants, um, those that are vaccine refusers are most clearly um, represented 
um, first and foremost by white evangelical Protestants, and then to a st uh, not insignificant degree, 23% among black Protestants who seldom or never attend church services. Although there, um, we do see a significant difference. Those who attend services among black Protestants, only 15% refusers. So uh, what we do see there is that 41% of black Protestants who seldom or never attend church are accepting of uh, vaccines, but more regular attendance jumps that number from 41% to 57%. So a significant increase there, um, which could do, be due to a whole range of different um, political factors. Uh, one last kind of chart looking at these numbers. We look at um, groups among whom half or more are vaccine hesitant or refusers. Um, what we see there again, is what we were just looking at with these kind of uh, religious nationalist politics. When you fuse republicanism with white evangelical Protestantism and uh, rural residency, you see we find the three biggest blocks of those who refuse or are hesitant to get COVID-19 vaccines. Again, this speaks to um, the kind of intersection of these different pieces of, of identity um, that go into forming part of this kind of white nationalist ideology. Obviously not only rural, um, we have urban uh, white nationalist as well. So despite the inroads by the Christian right under Trump and supporters like Pence, Pompeo, and Barr, um, Haynes argues that one key issue where they failed to really succeed on their kind of Christian right agenda was pushing for prioritizing um, the economy, religious institutions, and individual freedom over government COVID restrictions. So as Hayes reminds us, um, Christian nationalists are likely to scorn social distancing recommendations, be skeptical about the views of science on the coronavirus pandemic, claim that coronavirus-related lockdown orders unacceptably threaten both the economy and Americans' liberty, and to downplay or overlook the dangers to vulnerable members of society from catching the virus. And these are basically the same findings that Perry and all found in their research as well. Um, but Haynes also notes another important dynamic here, which is the crisis of legitimacy, which is something Jürgens Meyer talked about in our earlier readings. So Haynes suggests that when Christian nationalists were asked whom they trust for pandemic-related information, such as metal, medical experts or the CDC, they tended to choose President Trump, quote, by a landslide, followed by religious organizations and Republicans. So this is important because uh, Christian nationalists not only hold a sort of a radically different view than the majority of the U.S. public, but because they also reject the authority of these scientific experts, the CDC, public health officials, government officials, what they've essentially done is created this closed feedback loop and kind of closed media ecosystem in which public health messaging and kind of government messaging itself becomes fake news or kind of part of this broader secular liberal conspiracy um, that they and their kind of religious cohorts are opposed to. And that makes it even harder to try to get information and uh, kind of convince people within these circles um, to reconsider their beliefs and practices. Um, one of the key places that we've seen this kind of resistance to secular government um, restrictions playing out um, is the legal system. And the kind of courts have become the central battleground for groups like Liberty Council and others, both at the state and the federal level. So, for example, uh, Liberty Council's founder, Matt Staver, um, argued that California's COVID-19 restrictions in 2020, uh, it's, as he said, it's criminal in California to go to your neighbor's home to pray with them or have a Bible study. Let that sink in. You can go to prison in California for worshiping. Now, in exploring these debates, um, Haynes argues that one of the key, or perhaps the key constitutional question is this. Is free exercise of religion really being denied, as these various advocates have argued? Um, he suggests certainly not allowing religious services to take place as normal, these kind of temporary restrictions, um, are restrictions on the free exercise of religion. Um, especially the very important ability to assemble together in faith. However, Haynes argues, um, such restrictions temporarily end only one important aspect of faith. Um, they don't stop people from worshiping their own sort of God or following their religious traditions otherwise. Um, and as he notes, um, followers of pretty much all other faith traditions, including many Christians, um, had no problem moving their sort of religious practices online and accepting various social distancing measures. It may have been inconvenient, um, but Hindus, Buddhists, Jains, and many others did it anyway. So why is it not a restriction of their religious liberties, um, but
these conservative Christians only. So at the heart of this issue is not just a question of religious liberty um, or religious belief, um, but it's also, for many Christian nationalists, um, the intersection of these two. So as Haynes notes, uh, for many Christian nationalists, personal freedom and religious freedom are essentially the same thing. So here's uh, Matthew Staver to give us a bit of his take on these issues and the question of kind of religious ideology and what he sees as kind of this bigger culture war going on um, that he and his organization, Liberty Council, are trying to fight for um, for these Christian nationalists. As a pastor, I have never been more thankful for men like yourself, Amen. organizations, Amen. because who would have ever thought the day would come in the United States of America we'd have to have pastors defended by attorneys while you can riot in the street and do multi-millions yeah. dollars of damage. But if you want to gather, as you just said, in a home and have a Bible study or a worship service, you're criminal. So I yeah. just thank you for your heart Amen. to do this and uh, create an organization like it. Amen. Well, you know, the same thing was happening in California that was happening in Colorado that was happening in these other states. You know, at the same time, like in Colorado, as you well know, as Governor Polis was telling the churches that you couldn't meet or you could only have small numbers compared to everybody else that could meet, he was encouraging all the rioters and the yeah. protesters and the yeah. violent gatherings of people, encouraging them to continue to do what they're doing yeah. and say, well, that's, a, that's very important. We have to encourage that. California Governor Newsom did exactly the same thing. The template was the same. And unlike, say, if you, you look at Florida, it, it's part of an ideology. You know, Governor Ron DeSantis in Florida, uh, where our uh, ministry is headquartered, we also have offices in other places, but that's our headquarters. Um, we've had freedom in Florida for churches since April 1, 2020. Right. And it yeah. was, as, uh, as you know, the first pastor that got arrested, and that's Dr. Rodney Howard Brown, yep. on the last Sunday of March. Mm -hmm. Governor Ron DeSantis reacted to that. We were about ready to file suit. We were hours away from filing suit, and he changed that. Well, Governor DeSantis believes in marriage as the union of a man and a woman. He is pro-life. He's pro-America. He's pro-religious freedom, and we've had freedom in Florida for months. You go over to other places where you have other governors, whether it's Polis in Colorado or Newsom in California or Cuomo in New York, wherever it is, the template's the same. They're very pro-abortion, so they don't respect life, and then consequently they don't respect freedom. Yeah. And they don't respect God's design for marriage and the family. And to them, the church is just non-essential, and frankly, it's an annoyance, and they want to push it to the side. So, as we heard from Staver there, um, he and his organization, Liberty Council, have filed many lawsuits against these different state-imposed church restrictions, um, including the 2020 lawsuit um, that he was talking about there on behalf of uh, Harvest Rock Church, where Pastor Che On um, was located, and Harvest International Ministry in California. Um, there were a whole bunch of different lawsuits in the uh, appellate court and the district court, uh, some of which even went up to the Supreme Court, um, but ultimately... Um, not too many months ago, in May of 2021, a final settlement was reached between um, basically Liberty Council and the state of California. Um, and in that agreement, California agreed to no longer impose restrictions upon houses of worship um, and to pay Liberty Council about $1.35 million to cover their costs for litigating these cases. So Stavard argued, for example, that uh, Governor Gavin Newsom's COVID restrictions discriminated against churches while providing preferential treatment to many secular businesses and gatherings. Uh, and that Californians may never again place discriminatory restrictions on churches and places of worship. This is after the uh, May 2021 lawsuit. Pastor Allen's leadership and, and courage has toppled the tyranny and freed every pastor and church in California. Now, in their settlement, the courts basically told California that um, in the future, they had to impose the same set of restrictions on churches as they did with all other essential services, um, and with only really two very limited exceptions, um, couldn't place any further or new restrictions on religious gatherings in California. Um, but as Staver's comments really illustrate, both in the video um, and in other places that we read, Liberty Council sees their efforts in these lawsuits as part of an, a larger national strategy to try to overturn these public health restrictions um, on churches, not just in California, but in other states as well. 
Um, and so what we see then is a pattern in which in 2020, um, the courts largely upheld the right of states and the federal government to impose um, various public health restrictions on churches and houses of worship um, in order to keep people safe from COVID. Um, but by the sort of spring and now the summer of 2021, um, the courts began to back away from that position and are now giving greater latitude to these religious freedom arguments um, than they had in the past. And importantly, um, part of that may be due to the fact that the Supreme Court has shifted to an increasingly conservative religious Christian worldview um, in the past two years since the COVID outbreak began. Now, as Haynes suggests, um, following Trump's failure to win the 2020 election, um, Staver of Liberty Council believed that it was essential to challenge the restrictions on religious services in California. Um, and as we were just discussing, um, because the Supreme Court's new conservative sort of preponderance of members, now is the time to file the case. And, you know, Staver's uh, political intuitions were right, um, and uh, the timing was perfect. So as Haynes argued in his piece, um, the ability of state governors to close religious places of worship um, both illustrated the limits on the power of the president and the public health can take supremacy over religious freedom in America today. That may have been true in 2020, um, but what we're seeing with these new rulings in 2021, it suggests that um, removing religious restrictions and upholding arguments about religious freedom um, as Liberty Council and others have advanced um, are actually gaining much more political steam. And Haynes's claim that public health is still supreme over religious freedom um, in America may not be true for much longer. Now, as Staver has made clear um, in uh, the previous video clip and elsewhere, um, this is not just a fight about religious freedom, but it's actually part of this bigger ideological struggle. You heard him um, comparing um, the Black Lives Matter protest in 2020 to these kind of violent riots versus you know, people being arrested for trying to have a Bible study um, at their home in California. So he sees them as part of this broader ideological struggle between Christian nationalists and kind of secular government uh, forces which goes back to a point that Haynes made earlier, which is that state governors who ordered the closure of religious places of worship for normal meetings were vilified as aggressive secularists who acted in order not to protect public health, but to undermine religious freedom. And we heard this from Stevers in that video. He basically said that, you know, um, there's this template that all these liberal um, governors are following, that they don't care about life. Uh, and he kind of hinted at they're also uh, not American. So somehow they're not true kind of patriots. They're not, they don't fit up to this ideal of what a Christian nationalist should be. So I want to kind of end our week four discussion um, by looking at two final important points that Hayes makes in his piece. Um, the first one is he argues that this idea of religious freedom in America um, is not closed by the failure of Trump to win his reelection, and that for more than 40 years, the Christian right has been a powerful political influence um, in kind of raising these issues and has recently managed to essentially um, take over the political party of the Republicans and make religious freedom kind of a central Republican Party platform. And so along with the growing influence of Christian nationalists, um, these political trends are likely to continue shaping American politics for the foreseeable future, including the 2022 election. Secondly, Hayes argued that the corona pandemic um, has shown that there are certain conditions where religious freedom is not the first freedom in America. And rather, it's shown that public health, um, particularly when we see kind of a violent outbreak of a global pandemic killing hundreds of thousands of Americans, that that is more important than religious freedom and that religious freedom is necessarily and can necessarily be temporarily curtailed for the greater public good. Um, but as these uh, more recent court rulings in 2021 suggest, um, particularly with a new, more conservative religious Supreme Court, um, that may no longer be the case moving forward. And we may see um, not just arguments about religious freedom, but a whole range of arguments rooted in these kind of Christian nationalist uh, sort of ideologies and views, um, gaining more force in lawsuits that make their way up to the Supreme Court. So as we begin to see another surge, unfortunately, right now of COVID-19 outbreaks as um, both the sort of Delta variant increases uh, sort of its spread and reach, and as um, all those people who claim that you know, COVID is a hoax or the viruses don't work um, are getting infected because they are not vaccinated. Um, we're going to continue to see these debates involving public health measures and arguments about religious freedom um, 
probably growing more intense in the next year or two. So regardless of our interest in kind of religious studies, um, these are going to be political issues with a religious overtone that we're going to have to continue to think about, wrestle with, and engage with um, in the years uh, ahead. Okay, that wraps up our final week four lecture for our World Religions and Global Issues class. Thanks for hanging in there, going through um, all of this material. Just a couple of reminders. A few things are different this week since this is our final week of class. The uh, first one being that we end on Thursday. So technically we have a four day week um, with Thursday being our last day of class. The usual reminders, make sure you do the readings and the class videos for this week. Uh, one brief note on the Perry article, there's a lot of charts with regression analysis and alphas and betas and 0.01 and 001. Um, I'm not really worried about um, people dealing with all the nuances of the statistics in that. If you're comfortable dealing with statistics, that's great. I didn't get into it for this lecture here. Um, so don't worry too much about the charts. Um, just read kind of the substance of their findings in that piece. And uh, so kind of key discussions to remember for this week. Our final discussion post is going to be due on Tuesday this week instead of Wednesday. So it's Tuesday, July 20th, um, since we don't have that extra day on Friday. So it's getting bumped one day earlier to Tuesday. And then your peer responses will be due on Thursday, the 22nd. So post on Tuesday, responses by Thursday, and that'll effectively be like our Wednesday, Friday schedule of earlier weeks. And then finally, we have our, our second quiz, quiz number two, um, which is going to open on Wednesday, the 21st, and then it'll be open until Friday. So technically, our class ends on Thursday, but I'm going to keep the quiz open on Friday so that folks still have um, basically that two-day window to take that test. So um, again, Tuesday discussion post, Thursday peer response posts, and then Wednesday to Friday will be our final quiz number two. Okay, that's it for our week four lecture and our final lecture for our World Religions and Global Issues class. Thanks, everybody, and I will uh, see you in the chat rooms. Okay, bye.